this lecture. What are those beeps? Are they, do I cause them? No, okay. Um, so, um, uh, the effect of automation on jobs, considering both the optimistic and the pessimistic appraisals. Then I look at the question of skills, uh, because that's central um, to the current discussion. And finally, I consider some of the political consequences of automation, which don't really figure in the debate um, as, it, as, it's, uh, as you read about it. But it's very, very important. So first question, why do people work? Or why do they, people do paid work? Um, it's for two reasons. Because they have to perhaps the most important, and because work gives value to their lives. Um, it's usually a mixture of the, of the two. Uh, nevertheless, the two reasons have given rise to two opposing theories of work and its relationship with machines. Um, on the one side are the economists, and the economists figure not quite as villains in, the, in, in this set of lectures, but uh, as, as a bit on their own in many ways, um, because for them, work is simply a disutility, a cost, uh, the cost of living. Um, if people could get goods and services they want by working less, they would work less. And therefore, economists are natural supporters of labor-saving machinery. Um, on the other side are most social scientists. Um, people work to be valued. Um, paid work is valued work. Um, if there was no work for people to do, they would be less valued. I mean, that's the other, that's the other view of the matter. So work is an integral part, but um, uh, for, for most uh, people who, uh, non-economists who talk about it, but for economists, it's a cost to be lowered as much as possible and as quickly as possible. As you can see, we've already got into verbal difficulties here. Um, we use workforce and labor force interchangeably, but Hannah Arendt uh, made a very important distinction between work and labor. Work, she said, is the act of creating something permanent outside ourselves, but labor is the endlessly necessary work required to keep human life running smoothly. So they're not the same. And, but, but in fact, we talk about them as though they were identical. Labor, machinery which adds value to our work, is very different from machinery needed to keep us running smoothly. Um, on this view, automating work, that is reducing work to routine, is reducing work to labor. Um, it's just something to keep in mind as, as, as we go through. When we talk about the fear of unemployment, we're always talking about two things. Fear of losing our jobs, which bring us our bread, and fear of uselessness. Um, the American writer Studs Terkel sums this up beautifully. Work is about a search, too, for daily meaning as well as daily bread. For recognition as well as cash, for astonishment rather than torpor, in short, for a sort of life rather than a Monday through Friday sort of dying. But he wasn't an economist. Um, before entering the main discussion, I'd like to make two further points by reference to John Maynard Keynes um, and Karl Marx. Both were supporters of machinery, and for the same reason. They both saw it as a way of reducing the amount of necessary labor and therefore creating space for higher value activities. Um, they wanted to expand not idleness, but productive leisure. Marx has a famous passage about what people would do after machines had done, done their work. Um, the less you work, the less you had to work for your living, the more time you'd have to do things you really enjoyed doing. I mean, that was really a common theme to both thinkers. Both hated capitalism. I mean, this is uh, an important point of um, uh, agreement. While believing that capitalism was the only economic system which would make possible a good life for all. 
But whereas Keynes believed that capitalism would wither away naturally once it had filled up the world with capital goods, Marx thought that the kingdom of freedom would be possible only after uh, capitalism had been politically destroyed. In short, he was much more alert than was Keynes to the power of capital to keep goods permanently scarce for most people, both for exploiting wants and keeping wages low. Uh, I think keeping goods scarce, Keynes looked, looked to a time when goods would be so abundant that people would have to work very, very little to get what they wanted. As Marx said, no, not under a system like capitalism, which keeps goods scarce, artificially scarce. So that's the thought uh, I, I, I want to keep in your heads. And so this raises the central question of distribution. Can an economic system in which the means of production are largely privately owned ensure that the gains of productivity are shared sufficiently widely to enable the future that both Marx and Keynes wanted? Or do we need a different kind of system, socialism, uh, for example? And I think the jury's out on this. I don't think I don't think there's any alternative to capitalism at the moment, but there's no prospect of socialism either. Um, so we're in, in that position. Uh, until about 1980, um, it seemed as though capitalism wasn't doing too badly because trade union pressure and redistributive taxation were able to push up most incomes in line with productivity. And I, you're right, I was a member of the Social Democratic Party. Um, and I, still, that's, that's where my heart lies in what I call Keynesian social democracy. However, these forces of the mid 20, 30 years of, of the 20th century, which was a golden age for, in the West for, for, for most people, uh, much, much better than it had been before, have been in retreat since 1980. Conspicuous gainers of the tech revolution have been the tech billionaires like Elon Musk, estimated to be worth about $200 billion. Uh, conspicuous losers have been workers decanted into what the late David Graeber called bullshit jobs. So what's the current state of the debate? At the end of 2017, well, you know, one could go into these tedious figures, but anyway, McKinsey um, Global Institute published a report called Jobs Lost, Jobs Gain, in which they claim that 50% of working hours in the global economy could now, then, 217, be theoretically automated. Um, they didn't think anything like that would actually happen. They thought that the proportion was likely to see to exceed 30% in practice. And in fact, as the midpoint between two possible plausible scenarios, the report settled on 15% uh, of, of global jobs being automated um, uh, uh, in the next 25 years, um, um, uh, 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 but less than 5% of those would be fully automated because they thought that, in fact, um, um, uh, 60% of, of uh, that, 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 you know, you wouldn't be you wouldn't have to automate the whole of the job in fact there'd be parts of the jobs that would be automated and other parts that wouldn't be um and so anyway that that's the sort of standard type of prediction there have been many 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 reports saying exactly the same thing the figures vary a tiny bit but not by much now our culture is biased towards work rather than labor, uh, than leisure. And therefore, what is most stressed by the tech optimists is that automation will produce higher value activities in the workplace rather than outside the workplace. Work less and be more creative is the, th is the message you get from endless sort of um, uh, mission statements and 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 and, um, and 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 tech pronouncements, and the current. Now we come to this. The current consensus is that people most at risk of redundancy from automation will be those working in routine office and research jobs and low-paid precarious jobs like uh, shelf stackers. Back office work will be handed over to software tools, as all. Well the tiers of labor involving tedious repetition are automated. Managers would be needed for final decisions. 
the potential hemorrhage of jobs um, actually uh, sounds alarming if, if unconstrained. For example, blockchain, software that encrypts records across networks of computers so they verify each other, will remove the need for most accountants and law, law clerks. There will be no need for interpreters as voice recognition and AI-driven translation is perfected, nor indeed for drivers as pilots uh, uh, or pilots as driverless vehicles take control of roads, rail, seas and skies, and, and also, of course, of, 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 of uh, military airplanes. Um, online shopping and automated cashiers will eliminate in-store shop assistance. The time for bringing new medicines to markets will be cut from years to days as computers equipped with big data take over their testing. And so it goes on and so on. But having sort of sort of out, you know, produced a catalogue of all the jobs that will be lost. The the report goes on to say, as indeed do most of the optimistic reports, there'll be no net loss of jobs. As computers are unable to access subjective experiences, humans will continue to have the edge in the arts, in expression, in authenticity, in all the soft skills which computers can't yet quite manage. Um, there'll be increased demand for person-to-person -person jobs in the care sector. Elderly people won't like being looked after by robots. So, you know, humans will still be value, valuable there. Um, even um, jobs involving manual human dexterity, like bartenders, will also survive because robots are very clumsy at pouring drinks, for example. Um, however, the computer scientist Stuart Russell doubted whether there would be enough such jobs. He tells of showing to a colleague, Andrew McAfee, a video of a robot neatly folding a pile of laundry. Oh shit, was the response. That's another 500 million jobs gone. In short, humans can be replaced and in all tasks which can be automated, um, and there'll be, but there will remain some tasks for which they are still indispensable. And there will always be well-paid jobs for gurus, charlatans, frauds, consultants, experts, influencers, and all those sort of people. Right, now, what's, let me, let me um, just um, mention the case for machines. This, and I, it, it's based on four technical or theoretical technical arguments. This is the case for machines. First is the theory of complements. Um, this holds that a great deal of technology is potentially job enabling rather than job displacing. What is important for employment is not jobs but tasks. Most jobs contain non-routine tasks requiring social and emotional and higher cognitive skills which can't be automated. With suitable education and training, workers will be able to take on these higher value tasks in any jobs, while the more menial tasks will be taken up by machine. Now, as the spin for chat GPT, which has been in the news recently, um, uh, uh, puts it, um, instead of replacing human workers, AI is being used to assist and enhance their abilities. Do you, do you all use chat GPT? I do now. I mean, in fact, sorry, this is an aside to take up a bit more. Um, I asked a philosopher friend of mine to set ch chat GPT a question, an exam question, which um, went something like, um, um, is there um, anything uh, of value to be got from a female approach to philosophy? That was the question um, he, he, he said to ChatGPT, to which ChatGPT gave a very good reply. Um, so, so good that when he sent it to his colleagues, um, uh, one of them said, this is uncannily good. I mean, it's, of course, it's not at the top level, but it's a lot better than most of our students could do. So there's a problem for examiners, isn't there? Um, the second argument is the, biggest, the bigger pie effect. Uh, technology enables the pie to grow faster than population, creating new jobs by enlarging demand. 
And there are lots of examples of this, how this has happened in the past. The third argument is that technology changes the nature of the pie by producing a whole range of goods and services unthought of in the past, which are the source of new pleasures and new jobs. Um, specifically, the loss of manufacturing jobs through automation is matched by the expansion of service sector jobs. And so all through history, this has been going on. So these are three things. Um, there's the the the, um, uh, the 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 three things are the um, complements, bigger pie, and the changing nature of the pie. The fourth argument is more subtle and interesting. Um, machines increase the choice people have between work and leisure. Economists distinguish between income effects and substitution effects. As people's incomes rise, the opportunity cost of leisure, that is the wages foregone by not working, increase. And so people may work even more than before. That's the, that's the uh, substitution effect. On the other hand, higher incomes increase the attraction of leisure and could encourage people to work less. And that's the income effect. So, the, but the point, the important point about the, this sort of argument is that it, it, people's choice is enlarged. Um, they can go one way or the other. On the whole, uh, the life today, the life work balance may be tilting to less work, even um, if it means lower incomes than you might have got had you gone on working um, longer. So. You know, I, I think, I think um, again, this is something that, that is very much being discussed. The economists line up pretty solidly on the optimistic side of the argument, um, as their discipline almost forces them to do. And I just take two examples. Paul Krugman um, argues that the increased premium paid to highly skilled workers, while a key cause, I'm quoting, of the growth of earnings inequality in the United States and much of, in, or much of Europe is a passing phase. Inequality is a passing phase, he says. Humans will be ever be in ever shorter supply for such truly difficult occupations as gardening, house cleaning, and the thousands of other services that will receive an ever-growing share of our expenditure as consumer goods become steadily cheaper. So unskilled labor will be, or less skilled labor, will be in shorter and shorter supply, as a result of which their wages will rise, he predicted, relative to those of symbolic workers, that is you and me. Um, so um, that, was, uh, that was a prediction in 1996. It hasn't happened. Uh, will it happen in the long run? In the long run, we're all dead. Um, <clears throat> and the economist William Beaumont has a other offers another optimistic prognosis, and, and this is the concept of BOMO goods. Um, these are goods in which, the pro in which pro no productivity gains are possible. These are much truer of services than manufacturers. For example, it takes the same number of musicians to play a Beethoven string quartet today as it did in the 19th century. I mean, that's the famous example. Um, and, and yes, Mr. Bowman, or Professor Bowman, but are you sure that you couldn't have a Beethoven string quartet played by robots? Um, would you be able to tell the difference? Um, would they pass the Turing test? Or what about composing a Beethoven string quartet, not just playing it? Um, so, I mean, again, this argument, um, um, you know, um, starts to look a bit shaky. Now, Carl Frey, um, who's written a lot about this and rather interestingly, makes the essential point that acceptance of technological change has depended heavily on the way power is distributed in the economy. Um, during the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, a dominant manufacturing class, with the support of governments, was able to push through mechanization in the face of sometimes violent opposition from workers, you know, famously in England, the Luddites um, in the early 19th century. Um, uh, in, in, the, in the social democratic phase of, of, of our system, um, running from roughly 1945 to 1980, um, 
the fear of unemployment was dampened uh, by the commitment to full employment by governments and the welfare state, while strong trade unions were able to push up um, uh, incomes and moderate the pace of technical progress. Uh, so there was a sort of measured uh, and, 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 and modest growth of technology with a fair, reasonably fair sharing out of, of, of the gains of it. But since the 1980s, we know this has gone into reverse. Um, and, and that's provoked populist backlashes by the losers. So we come, concluding this optimistic section, Harvard Business Review 2018. There will be some bumps in the road, and there is no room for complacency, no. Uh, on issues of workforce displacement and the ethics of smart machines. No room for complacency. But with the right planning and development, cognitive technology could usher in a golden age of productivity, work satisfaction, and prosperity. So that's, that is the conclusion of that set of arguments. Now we come to the case against machines. Um, and what the pessimists say is that whatever may have been the case in the past, the current wave of automation differs from that of previous technological upheavals by automating mental work in addition to manual work. Not only does technology bite ever deeper into its called cool cognitive work, but does so at an accelerating rate. There will be no longer office jobs for aspiring manual workers. In fact, there will soon be almost no jobs that robots couldn't do as well uh, as us. Therefore, redundancies due to automation will inevitably exceed those caused by the mechanization of the past. Some new jobs may be created, but fewer than those destroyed. I mean, that's the, the core of the pessimistic argument. And its main advocate or famous advocate is, is an entrepreneur called Martin, Martin Ford, who was also a product of Sil Silicon Valley in its early days. His argument is that as the costs of distributed machine intelligence fall to zero, more and more firms will automate. As a result, emerging industries will rarely, if ever, be highly labor intensive. As creative destruction unfolds, the destruction will fall primarily on labor intensive businesses in the service sector, while the creation will generate new businesses and jobs that simply don't hire that many people. Um, we will be left, um, uh, in a, in a well-known phrase, with lovely jobs at the top and lousy jobs at the bottom. Um, then there's, a, there's a, an economist and, and, and a futurist, as he's called, called um, uh, Yuval Noah Harari. And he sort of wobbles between these two positions. Yes, 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 yes. General medical practitioners will be replaced by robots. True. But precisely because of this, there'll be more money for human-led research and development of new medicines and surgical procedures. Yeah. Um, another possibility is that instead of competing with robots, humans could focus on leveraging them. Drones eliminate jobs of some pilots, but create new opportunities in maintenance, remote control, data analysis, and cybersecurity. In chess, the combined efforts of humans and computers out, outperform both humans and computers separately. This is an, uh, an argument for complement. Um, so the new job market in 2050 may well be characterized by computer-human cooperation, not competition. That's Harari in his optimistic vein. Uh, but... But these new jobs will not solve the job problems of unskilled laborers. Uh, and so, you know, he says as robots take over cognitive work, the skill, skills gap grows and with it the length of the transition. So, I mean, there you have, you, you know, you have the kind of uh, um, uh, balanced view, if you like. In 1930, Keynes um, feared the technological unemployment would grow, grow as productivity growth uh, exceeded, came to exceed labor absorption. 
So far, this doesn't seem to have happened. Measured unemployment after peaking under uh, President Reagan and Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s as part of the drive to reduce headcounts in government subsidized industries um, fell to average levels of, of about 5% in advanced countries. Um, this could be called the natural rate of unemployment, if you want to use those terms. But it's much, much lower level than depression levels of unemployment. Um, before the Great Recession in 2007-2008, unemployment in the UK stood at 4%. Um, then it went up, in, uh, went up a bit, then it came down to about 4%, then it went up in COVID. And now the forecast is that by 2024 next year, it will be down to about 3-4%. to 4%. Um, However, however, let me make this point. Headline figures of unemployment do not in any way accurately reflect the um, level of work in an economy, much less um, the quantity of decent work. Um, and this is for the following reasons. First, we see a growth of underemployment. People who'd like to work more hours but can't. And if you add those to the headline unemployment figures, you've got to double them. Second, um, stagnation of average real wages, which suggests the gains from automation are accruing to a minority. Third, deterioration in the conditions of work, measured by growth in numbers of working age people in precarious jobs, zero hour contracts, exploitative forms of self-employment. And I'm missing a page. That's brilliant. Um, but I think I can um, probably carry on from memory. I don't know why, 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 why that page is missing. Um, and then there's, of course, um, the uh, some some other other uh, very very uh, worrying um, uh, things going on in the labour market. Um, maybe I can't remember what they were. There were anyway six of them. So. Um, um, what you get at the um, what what you uh, oh yeah here we are I haven't lost a page oh yes the growth of what Guy Standing calls the precariat this is a good word uh, it, um, it 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 may reflect a choice for better life life work balance but in many cases results from simple inability to find secure employment. Uh, then there's been a growth in the proportion of low-skilled to total jobs. Then the public sector has been absorbing jobs um, shed by the private sector. It's been a kind of sink of, of sort of work to keep unemployment figures down. Then there's the increase in subsidised jobs as governments pay private companies to keep people working who would otherwise be made redundant. Um, then there's the growth in private debt, a measure of the inability of people to make a living from their earnings, and, and then um, the growth of overemployment in some sectors, as more and more people are driven to work longer hours by demands of the job or the need to make ends meet. In other words, what Marx would call a speed up in the rate of exploitation. Uh, and and stress relation is stress-related disease is on the rise. And, and finally, there's been a growth of job surveillance as employers develop more powerful means of monitoring job performances. So all of this is sort of really a deterioration in, in, in the job situation of, of, of a lot of people. And you've got to offset that against the, the gains, aggregate gains um, of productivity. You've got to bear that that set of social details in um, in your in your in your head. Now, let's look at one. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm get, trying to get through in time, so there'll be time for questions. I, I do want to take one look at the skilling um, and uh, 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 upskilling or, or downskilling debate. Um, 
And um, again, a lot of the um, standard views on the matter assume that we will get over the bump if we can upskill our workforce. And I just want to quote from ILO, um, uh, their latest report on this. Policy debates are placing renewed emphasis on lifelong learning. This is based on the understanding that lifelong learning and skills development increase workers and firms' capability to adapt to changes in the world of work. Um, end quote. In other words, humans have to be have to up their game. Humans have to up their game um, in order to race with the machines. Um, so, um, what do we what do we make about that? Um, what what does upping their game mean? Um, is it um, does it mean upskilling or downskilling? I mean, everyone thinks it means upskilling, but take this example. Imagine a worker receiving instructions on how to make a pair of shoes through augmented reality goggles. All the steps in the operation are precisely choreographed. Anyone of normal dexterity will be able to manufacture an acceptable pair of shoes from such instructions. Can we really say that the people making shoes through, through reality goggles have been upskilled or downskilled? It would be odd to say that they know how to make a pair of shoes. They're simply following instructions. Um, and the world of work is obviously, in one sense, a world of lost skills. I mean, no one knows how to do invisible mending any longer. Why should they throw away the clothes, got hold of them, buy a new one? They're, they're very, very, very cheap. Now, Adam Smith. He understood all this very, very well, and he had a famous, a famous um, example of a pin factory. And he describes a pin factory that's been set up. One, one man draws out the wire, another straights it, a third cuts it, a fourth points it, a fifth grinds it at the top for receiving the head to put it on. It's a peculiar business to whiten the pins is another. It, it, it's even a trade by itself to put them into the paper. And the important business of making a pin is, in this matter, divided in eight, into 18 distinctive operations, which in some manufacturers are all performed by distinct hands. And it's, it's brilliant because uh, what, 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 what you can do is uh, you can um, uh, uh, cut costs by this and, and produce more pins at the same time. So it's absolutely, uh, it's, it's, it's very much in the center of the optimistic case. Division of labor and, and mechanization are not the same, but they're very closely connected. Now, this is what Adam Smith goes on to say. Um, the man whose whole life is spent in performing a few simple operations of which the effects are perhaps always the same or very nearly the same has no occasion to exert his understanding or to exercise his invention in finding out expedients for removing difficulties. And generally, and therefore loses the habit of such exertion, and generally becomes as stupid and ignorant as a human creature can become. So, on the one hand, Adam Smith is saying, look, division of labor is really the path to prosperity. But on the other hand, it makes everyone stupid. Well, that's obviously something to talk about. Now I come to my last, very my last point, which I think is important on the political, political um, consequences of automation. Um, and so I think they're very serious. Um, you know, there's a cost to every improvement. There are good grounds for arguing that the benefits from mechanizing work, work have exceeded the losses. Good arguments. The Luddites were right for their own trade, but wrong for all trades taken together. However, there's no guarantee that this will remain true, this balance that's been struck, and good reasons for doubting that it will. Uh, neither the optimistic nor the pessimistic arguments consider at all carefully what effect the structure of jobs has on the political system. Thus, at the very minimum, 
One can't take comfort from the argument that automation creates as many new jobs as it destroys if it promotes a structure of occupations inimical to the survival of the kind of democracy we have. How could this happen? Because it, how could this be? It, it requires us to distinguish between mechanization and automation. Mechanization displaced unskilled labor in agriculture, uh, agriculture, manufacturing, and transport. Its most important social consequence, this mechanization, was the relative enlargement of the professional, managerial, and administrative administrative strata in both private and public sectors. The social theory which registered and analyzed this shift was, was known as armed bourgeoisement. It was a very, very popular social science concept in the, in the 1960s and 70s. Mainstream social scientists welcomed armed bourgeoisement. Socialists regretted it, of course, but mainstream social sciences welcomed it as strengthening the stability of the democratic system. In fact, prospects for democracy in developing countries were thought to depend on the growth of the middle class. There was a very strong connection there between the enlargement of the middle class and the development of the habits of compromise and, and, and reflection, which were thought to be the, the, the qualities of a middle class electorate rather than a, 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 you know, a, a purely working class electorate. Now we see a reversal. A middle class created by mechanization is being hollowed out as increasing numbers of white killer jobs are being automated. As a consequence, the expansion of the service economy has gone together with the relative shrinkage of middle class jobs and earnings. The skill can no longer command the premium, the premium of status and rewards that made them feel superior to the class below them. This is the political meaning of the phrase lovely jobs for those at the top and lousy jobs for everyone else. Now, I think the enthusiasts of automation are blind to the risks that this reversal poses for constitutional democracy. The centralized bureaucracy sitting precariously atop resentful fragments of a shaken society is the classic recipe for populist dictatorship. I mean, you know, this is, this is the classic analysis of how this happens from Max Weber and many others. If this is how liberal democracy ends up, automation will have had a big share in bringing it about. Thank you. Thank you very much for the great lecture. And we have a bit of time for questions, in fact, 10, 15 minutes. So just please raise your hand if you have any question and we'll get a microphone to you. I think my colleague has a microphone. Okay, everyone is, yeah, and there's one right in front, Julius. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the lecture. Um, if automation will kill the liberal democracy in some of the advanced countries, so are actually, by your argumentation, the Chinese already ahead because they already introduced the non-liberal democracy and maybe can manage it using uh, authoritative methods uh, more efficiently, this problem. So that's the first question. And second, how all this is important for like uh, Africa or other or or countries with low incomes? So is this problem only of the Anglo-Saxons or it actually is a wide problem of humanity? Thanks. Yeah, oh well, God, Do, um, it's a good question. I mean, I think, I think going, going, <coughs> I'm mean, going back to Max Weber. He didn't think that um, uh, capitalism was the only way in which you can uh, uh, um, 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 uh, achieve the 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 um, uh, what what he called the rationalization of society. He thought it could be done by bureaucratic dictatorship. Um, 
as a theoretical possibility. And in fact, we now see it's being done in China. What he thought was peculiar about the Western model was that it was done by a class that was independent from the state. And that was the basis of, a, you know, the constitutional, liberal, or the constitutional way of modernizing a society. There was a bureaucratic way, and there was a constitutional way. And I think uh, one of the things I was arguing is if you remove that independent class, if you hollow it out in one way or another, if automation achieves that, then you are left with a bureaucratic state on top. And, and underneath, there's just fragments. Um, I mean, minority groups who do not cohere into um, a, a, a into a major political force. Again, the thing, the thing, the interesting point I think about the sixties and seventies. Um, we now think the trade unions, or many people think, and the trade unions were a ghastly break on progress and abused their power. And they were crying, but they were a big block, a political block. They were they were there, and therefore they were part of the political system. Uh, a major part of the political system, just as employers were. In, and, and those those sort of blocks that enabled, you know, a stable kind of democracy based on ideological differences, but able to compromise their differences, um, that seemed to be um, eroding away. I'll say a bit more about that in my last in my last uh, lecture. So I think this is an important implication. And as for Africa, well, you tell me. <laughs> oh yes, so a lot to digest in this last hour. Uh, one point that you did mention: one of the reasons people work is, of course, to get paid. And two, what one reads a lot now is about the increased concentration of wealth among fewer and fewer people. Uh, what are the implications with all this development of work automation in the distribution of wealth? Is UBI something we should be looking at uh, here? Two, also another factor that jumped into my mind is our changing demographics, particularly in the Western societies. We have more and more people who are living longer, but the retirement age is uh, not really going up. So we're going to have fewer and fewer people in the workforce, which in a way then this automation is a plus. Yeah, well, I mean, UBI could be financed very well from um, uh, uh, not a total confiscation of the wealth of about 12, 15, 16 super billionaires. I mean, so, you know, I mean, um, you're talking of universal basic income. Yeah, a universal basic income is one of the is one of the ways in which you could share out the gains in productivity. In, you know, you can think of a national dividend that grows and everyone, every citizen is entitled to a share of it. I mean, that was the sort of philosophy behind, original philosophy behind yeah, <coughs> universal basic income. <coughs> The reason why some people don't like universal basic income, I, I don't think it should really be based on the affordability of it. I mean, that was one of the initial objections, is that it detaches income from work. So it cuts at one of the, um, one of the um, bases, bases of self-respect um, and, and sense of adding value to the society. I mean, here is the national dividend that's growing because the machines are making it, and you're not contributing to it anymore. It's as though it's as though the human population has now retired, the whole of it. It's done its bit in the 19th century and up to now, and now it can live off, it, live off the rent. But, you know, if you think of a, of, a, of, a, of a human population living off the rent created by the machines, um, well... Uh, I don't think most people feel that that's the sort of future they'd want, really. It doesn't mean they don't want to work less. It doesn't mean they don't want jobs to get better, more decent conditions, more creative possibilities, all that. So full employment need, needn't mean 35, 40 hours a week. It may mean 25 hours a week with other income or 20 hours other income from other sources, including universal basic income. Um, but... You know, if you carry it to its logical conclusion, of course, it's an absurd future to project um, for, 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 for humanity. 
Um, uh, that was the first point. And then you had a second Our question. Our changing demographics, Demographic. the aging of the, of oh, the population. Yes, yes, absolutely. And there, of course, um, you're getting fewer and fewer people in work, more and more people relying on their work to um, to to sustain longer. Well, one uh, one way, uh, one way, I suppose, of dealing with it, Macron try, has just done it in France to enormous, enormous opposition, is just extend, delay the age at which state pension is payable. So you take into account the fact that life expectancy is growing, um, but why then should you? I mean, if you live, if everyone can expect to live to be eighty-five, why should they retire to sixty-five the, or, or sixty? I mean, the um, that's that's the sort of argument. Um, and in fact, pensions, state pensions, were not really a big expense for the exchequer when they were introduced earlier. Um, in, in the last century, because no one lived much longer than, than, than when they stopped work. And they stopped work at 60 and died at 65. I mean, so, you know, the, the, the cost was very small. Now you retire at 60, you get your state pension, you live to be 90. Um, so that effect has changed. But in terms of its effect on work, um, I think... Um, you know, it's too easy to argue, well, you know, you switch from, uh, I don't know, um, making making a car to looking after old people. Um, I mean, you have to really ask then, um, of course, you, have, you know, you pay professional carers and, and there, there should be jobs, but it's not a very nice job, actually. Um, and... Um, I mean, we all we, it, it, morally, it's a very good to do it, but actually, um, you you start looking after me when all my functions have stopped working, and I'm still I've still got another five years of living. Okay, so I we we need to we need to know whether these are really attractive um, opportunities for people displaced from one job. The the, the the democratic, democratic, dem, demographic shift. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, thank you for the lecture. I have a more like a theoretical question. So, in the uh, Varieties of Capitalism book, uh, Holland Sosky, I guess, in the introduction, they stated that the uh, liberal market economists and uh, coordinate market economists, among others, they have different approach, let's say, approaches to innovation. The one is radical innovation and the other is, uh, well, um, incremental. So my question is, can we expect that more job tasks, more jobs would be automated, for example, in the economy like the UK or the US than in Germany or in Japan? So how the structure of the, econ of the economy can influence the prospect of automation of job tasks in this economy? Well, I mean, you're right. I mean, different... different um, uh, structures of political economy, if you like, which involves politics and, and, and the structure of power in the society, does determine different rates of automation. Of course it does. For example, if there's no constraint on cost-cutting or labor-saving, um, because uh, the, 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 the entrepreneurial class has been unchained, unchained, if you like, then there'll be a faster rate of automation. Um, but if so, are you talking about constraints um, which are um, um, uh, uh, um, part of a political economy? Good. My question was like in terms of job structures, like because a lot of factors they structure do jobs differently in this economy. Yeah. Can we say that because of like, the politics, because of like industrial relations, whatever, the job tasks, the jobs themselves in liberal market economies would be more susceptible? To, to automation than in, than in coordinate market economy. Than in a coordinate. coordinate. So the, the term coordinated is Germany, that Germany, Germany is Germany the example of that. 
differences in capitalism debate. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. German, for example. yeah, well, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm quite, I'm quite receptive to that kind of argument. Uh, I mean, of course, there's not a single model of capitalism. I mean, um, there's also capitalism with Chinese characteristics, which um, um, is, is yet another, is yet another model. But in general, you're right. It must be, it must be the case that different models of capitalism um, determine different, uh, not only rates of automation, but different structures of automation. Robert, just a question about uh, political consequences of automation at the end. I wonder whether you could talk a little bit about the university in relation to the potentially catastrophic consequences of automation for the middle class. Is the university part of the problem or part of the solution here? Well, I would say it was a victim. Um, <laughs> um, uh, it could be. I don't think the university, I don't see university as a problem, um, e except in so far as uh, um, uh, lots of academics don't seem to um, really be open to debate on these sorts of questions. I mean, then it's a problem and you think, well, what is a thinking institution doing if it's not thinking on the scale that um, the age requires? But I would say it was a victim in the sense that um, uh, the notion of and it, the traditional notion of, 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 of a university, um, and that was true in the West, it was, let's say, you know, it starts with Plato's Academy. I mean, this is an independent institution. I mean, it's there for one purpose, which is to think. I mean, the sort of things they thought about in Plato's Academy were not about science in the way we know it. They were about moral philosophy, about the ideal structure of a state, um, about the, the good of the soul, um, and, and those sort of things. Which, which are, but, but they, they weren't part of a state system. All universities now, it seems to me, are through their funding primarily, but also um, through their conception of themselves in, 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 as part of a, as a bureaucratic order uh, are all really part of state machines. And, 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 and as, as indeed are most churches. Um, not all, but most. I mean, you know, think of these national churches everywhere. So not just the Russian Orthodox Church that supports Putin. But, you know, they all you listen to what our bishops say in the House of Lords and you realize what a national church is. Um, so so it's um, I would say that was the, the, the point. They've lost their independence um, because of their funding base has shifted um, and therefore they are victims now, um, which is which is tremendously sad because they're in a huge resource for any free society, independent universities. Huge resource, um, but um, you know they've they've they've, they've um, uh, and that's all I can say. I mean, in answer to your question, yeah, it's just the last question then. So, Robert, uh, uh, this is a problem you didn't address, but I think it's a problem uh, which might interest you, and that is the whole question: What about the future of work in scenarios where people are taking the ecological question very seriously and are saying the logic of consumer capitalism is something which needs to be critically thought about? So that degrowth would be an answer. So if economies were to think. Uh, in terms of uh, a degrowth economy, not growing as you know we are using up resources continuously, what would that mean for the future of work? Well, you're, um, uh, Shalini, you're, you're broached on the subject of my fourth lecture here, but no, but a very quick reply. I mean, degrowth, to my mind, means actually not just a six-month pause on automation, but a very very long pause on automation. I mean, if you take if you take degrowth seriously, it's sort of you you've got to. I mean, degrowth really means reducing productivity, growth, 
and um, and 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 actually um, uh, starting um, uh, uh, not not just uh, you know starting to 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 welcome more inefficiency. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, exactly, and that would that would. Yeah, that's also part of it. Uh, certainly, a very important part. So, if you take degrowth seriously, you are wanting to reverse the uh, momentum towards uh, uh, continuous growth, which machinery and it, tech, technical innovation has made possible. You see. So if you really want to go the other way, you've got to start questioning the value of technological innovation and start um, start um, uh, checking or, 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 or thinking very seriously about the idea of instrumental efficiency as the goal for every activity. So it involves a very radical shift, actually, from where we are. Bits of it are happening as as apocalypse sort of sort of uh, draws nigh but not on the whole I mean not at the official level I don't think um, so I will talk more about it I hope um, in the fourth lecture well, thank you very much and on that note I think we have come to the end of our hour but we can uh, go on with the discussion at the reception in the back so all are welcome don't forget that the second talk will be next week and Lord Skidelsky is also around. If you want to meet him, there's an opportunity to do that. So thank you very much. Through there? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, it's, a, it's such a difficult stuff. I mean, you know, there's so many facets to it, aren't there? I mean, it's, it's very hard. I find this in, in writing the whole book. I constantly want to talk about something else, and I have to sort of try and keep a thread running. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, yes, yes. So I'll just stop by once, uh, invite you for a lunch or something, for a coffee or whatever. Yeah, well, of course, I'd love to. I'm, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm in Vienna for a month. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, He's on for a month, almost. Well, are you? Yeah. Six weeks. Six yeah. weeks? Yeah. Great. And so it's not your first visit, I know, no, no, because I've I, seen, I, I've met well, you before. Yeah. Well, not here. So where? In Russia. In Russia. Yeah. So she... Last time I think we met in Omsk. In Omsk? Yes, in Omsk. Have I? Yeah, I've been there. Yeah, we were there together. With Liana? With, with Liana, Lena, Liana, Lena and uh, Shirley Williams was there, so that's yeah. the last time. Yeah, Probably, or maybe, maybe more recently. Well, I remember that very, very well, and I wrote, I wrote, I wrote it up that visit. I actually published an account. Um, I thought it was. Um, in, was there. Yeah, um, I thought it was Irkutsk. Yeah. And you're right, it's not Omsk, 